Hello, everyone. And uh, just a couple of administrative things. Uh, the meeting's being recorded. If you don't want your face to show up, uh, then uh, Craig, what are we supposed to do? If you don't want to, what do you do? Simply turn your video off on the bottom left as your Zoom toolbar and click stop video. Okay. Uh, there are going to be at least one opportunity where we're going to go into uh, breakout groups, uh, small groups, and I would encourage you uh, to go into those breakout groups, even if you don't wish to participate, uh, just to uh, be, be part of the conversation. Uh, but I hope that you will uh, participate. Uh, and thank you all for being here. And we're going to uh, continue with uh, a, little, a little melody. <clears throat> and I urge you to uh, uh, sing this nigun along with me. But you need to mute yourself if you're going to sing with me. You got, you got to mute yourself. Lai la lai 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 la lai 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 that's the melody of, the, uh, of a lot of the high holiday liturgy. Uh, that melody certainly brings me into a, a place of uh, being together in the sanctuary. We're going to be together in a different way this year. In fact, the text that we're going to look at talks about the importance of us being together. And one of the things that we we have to struggle with uh, this year is not being able to, to do that. Uh, it must be like uh, our friends that are uh, long distance members like David Foster, who is the, the one Jew in his, in his vicinity in the middle of, of Texas. Uh, so he's able to be with us in community all the time because this is, this is his community now. And, and he's connected to us in, in a lot of different ways, but he's never prayed in our sanctuary uh, with us. And so that's part of the, the challenges that we, we have this year. Uh, Judaism is very much a, uh, a construct of, of hope and joy and of blessing and goodness, but there is an aspect to the high holidays and specifically this chapter that we're gonna look at together today uh, this teaching from uh, from this book here. This is real, and you are completely unprepared. Uh, if you don't, I know that you've received some of the chapters because we're studying them. Uh, and if you don't own this book, it's it's a book you should buy. Uh, there you go, Gail, Alice. Uh, it in terms of preparing for the holidays, it's really a a wonderful wonderful resource. Uh, this particular chapter that we're going to look at, the focus is really on long-range hope and joy, long-range blessing and goodness. And to kind of get to that point, we have to take a careful look at our lives and uh, really own what's going on in our lives. It's, it's in some ways not, not immediately comforting. There's, there's a, a part of being at the holidays that I find to be very comforting, but that's mostly around uh, the community and the memories. The liturgy asks us to, to do something that's very difficult, and that's to really take a careful, careful look at ourselves and to own our existence. And specifically on Yom Kippur, uh, it is, as one of uh, my colleagues refers to it, Yom Kippur is mortality therapy. We're to imagine ourselves as if we are dead. Now, that idea is not filled with hope and joy and goodness and blessing uh, unless we embrace it and we look at, at that idea of dying and that it encourages us and encourages us to 
enter back into living in a renewed way, uh, not just in the same way that we were, but to really challenge the, the assumptions uh, that, that we have. This chapter that we're gonna look at deals primarily with the awe, the A-W-E of an aspect of the holiday of Slichot. Uh, this Saturday evening is Slichot. Slichot is typically the Saturday evening before Rosh Hashanah, unless the Saturday evening before Rosh Hashanah is less is more is less than three days away. So, because Rosh Hashanah is on uh, Monday evening, Saturday night's only two days away. So, Slichot ends up moving back an entire week. So, this Saturday evening at eight o'clock, we have a Slichot program at the temple. It's uh, it's available both by Zoom and in person. Uh, we are going to be outside. Uh, plan A is we're going to be outside for the entire program, the movie, a discussion, and the services. Plan B, we're going to be in the sanctuary for all of it, for those of you that wish to come in person. Otherwise, the entire program will be available uh, via, via Zoom. Um, this, uh, the book is, uh, this particular chapter, I think, um, has got a lot of hyperbole in it. Really, uh, it, it asks us to, to go to a very difficult place because it doesn't say it quite in this way, but uh, uh, I like it uh, said in this, repentance, the process of repentance is meant to kick our tuchuses. If you don't feel like your tuchus got kicked, then you're just kind of cruising, cruising through it. We are uh, in this process of cheshbon hanefesh, of the accounting of our soul, uh, we are to challenge all of the assumptions that we have in our life, not just to measure whether we did, how we did against our assumptions last year, but actually to challenge the assumptions. Uh, so uh, we're going to continue into the text. And before we do that, I wanted us to do the blessing together for the study, the acquisition, uh, for occupying ourselves in study. Uh, it's the same as the Friday night candle blessing, except the ending is La Asok Bidivre Torah. So let's do that together. Baruch Ata Adonai, Enu Melech Olam, Asher Kitshanu Bemitzvota Betzivanu La Asok Bidivre Torah. Amen. So uh, we do a lot of things unconsciously. We don't pay attention, and this chapter asks us to pay attention. I just did one of those things. I'm used to Zooming. And when I Zoom at the temple, I have my headphones in. Mm. I always take my headphones out so I can say the blessing. Because when you're all talking, I can't, I can't say the blessing. I lose my place because of the, the jumble. And so when I said, let's say the blessing, I don't know if any of you noticed, I went, Baruch, I went to take my headphones out because I'm not paying attention. This chapter that we're gonna look at asks us deeply to pay attention. We are gonna do a little bit of reading in it uh, and we're all gonna also do some, some talking. So uh, if I can get a volunteer, thank you, Bobby, for volunteering, I appreciate that. Uh, and I'm gonna share the screen here. And I'd like to be better at, uh, at scrolling in this text than I am, but here we go. A mindful awareness of our circumstances often makes things seem worse and not better. This is an illusion, of course, but it doesn't feel like one, especially when we are in the first throes of discovery. Suddenly aware of problems we never knew we had, we may genuinely feel that we are much worse off than we thought we were. We may feel a sense of urgency, even of desperation, about our plight. This urgent, desperate sense is the emotional basis of Slichot. The week of urgent, desperate prayer 
that commences approximately three weeks into the process of, you know, I've got a thing blocking this. Can you move it up? Uh, about, our, about our plight. This urgent, desperate sense is the emotional basis of Sliocha, the week of urgent, desperate prayer that commences approximately three weeks into the process of daily contemplation. We begin with the blowing of the shofar on the first day of El. Okay, so just a couple of definitions here. <clears throat> the word slichot actually means uh, apology or I am uh, being sorry. Uh, it's at its core sense, it means ex basically excuse me. So uh, there's uh, I, a couple of times uh, I was on a bus in Israel when I was learning Hebrew. And as I was walking by people, I would say slicha. And at one point, which slicha means excuse, like, excuse me. And so I was saying, and there was, I had to get through and I was saying slichot, slichot. I was trying yeah. to practice my Hebrew. And someone looked at me and said, no, slichot is not for a few months away. Uh, but so the, the, the name of this, the name of this, uh, of this festival or not this festival, this observance, slicha, is this uh, 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 introduction, if you will. It's, here it says the culmin, the, uh, uh, that it's three weeks into this process that began on the first day of Elul, and we're getting closer and closer to Rosh Hashanah and you know this week of urgent, desperate prayer. So... This text is asking us to be urgent and desperate about looking at our at our lives. So we're going to. Yeah, no, hold on. Just me trying to figure out how to use the technology here. Hold on. Okay, Bobby, go ahead. Yeah. Traditionally, Slichot begins with a midnight prayer service on the Saturday night before Rosh Hashanah or on the previous Saturday night if there are fewer than four days between that Saturday and Rosh Hashanah and continues with special prayers of, application, of supplication recited by the pious at dawn each day of the following week. But even if we are not so pious, even if we don't attend the Slichot service on Saturday night that serves as a kind of grand overture to the high holiday season, we may still feel a sense of urgency. You have to move it up there. So there's, I've got this thing on the screen and I don't know how to get rid of it. <laughs> um, even if we are not, you may still feel it. This is particularly true if we have been paying attention to the larger process. If we begin on Tisha B'Av by allowing ourselves to be reminded of the ways we have become alienated from ourselves and from God, if we heard the shofar blow on the first day of Elul and began a month of contemplation and taking account of our souls, after all, in less than one week, we will stand before God. If we are tuned in to this reality, we can't help but feel urgent and desperate now. So this text, uh, if, 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 if we are tuned into this reality, the reality being a sense of urgency, a sense of desperation, we can't help but feel urgent and desperate now. So uh, the author, uh, Rabbi Alan Liu, he's asking us, as does our tradition, to take this, this period of time very, very seriously. Uh, and now we're going to get down into, uh, go ahead, Bobby, you're doing great. Right. The ritual of Slichot is first mentioned in an obscure compilation of medieval Midrash, the Tana Devait Eliyahu Zuta. Very nice. <laughs> David knew that the temple would be destroyed in the future and the sacrificial cult would be nullified. And David was troubled thinking, how will Israel make atonement then? So God said to David, when troubles come upon Israel, 
let them one stand before me together as a single unit two and make confession before me three and say the salihot forgiveness service before me and i will answer them okay so uh while there are uh uh formulas for this confession typically what's being Met, mentioned here are our what's being referred to here are our own personal confessions our own you know there's lists and lists of confessions that we read in the prayer book but uh it this is not the the formula uh uh that we're being presented in the prayer book but rather our our stuff that we need to deal with and the slichot the forgiveness service here they're talking specifically about the prayers. And then we're going to look at one more paragraph here. We really are. <laughs> Let me try it another way here. Come on. You want me to get my book? <laughs> No, no. Oh, okay. Good, Rabbi. How far down do you want to go? Rabbi, oh, there, may be, there may be a scroll bar on the. Uh, there we go. Center. Okay. Here we go. Huh? You got it. There you go. Can you see this, Bobby? Big enough to. Yeah, read? but the top of the page. Yep. It's the top of the page. But how did God reveal these services to Israel? God came down from the heavenly mist like a sh shaliach, Sabor, a panther, wrapped in a talit and revealed to Moses the order of the service of forgiveness. Okay. So we have these three different things that were being taught. Uh, in the in, in among the first textual references to this notion of of uh, slichot, uh, this teaching that Dave, the King David somehow knew in the future that uh, that uh, the temple was going to be destroyed and we were no longer going to be bringing sacrifices to atone for our, for our sins, uh, and how would we then deal with uh, with uh, not being able to make atonement without the temple and without making sacrifices. And God said to King David in the future, here are the three things. One, stand together as a single unit. Two, make confession. And three, uh, make personal confession. And three, make this communal confession. So we're going to go into breakout groups for just about three or four minutes. And I want you to uh, talk about the question that in this age of COVID, what does it mean for us to stand together as a single unit? You know, King, the, the, the charges that we're supposed to gather, but how, how do we do that uh, in, uh, when in the, in, with the pandemic going on? And I would challenge you to extend that beyond this specific moment. And I gave the example of of David Foster, who, who's uh, not able to uh, be near a, a, a community in person. And if you think back to the times uh, when this medieval Midrash was written, there were no buses or trains or airplanes. You were near your community and you were able to uh, connect in that way. But now, we can go anywhere. We can be anywhere at any time, uh, not necessarily where we want to be, uh, but we have the ability to travel and to move. We can be live in the middle of Texas or in the middle of Florida uh, or anywhere. How do we make community? How do we come together as a community? So I'm going to uh, break you up into breakout groups for about three or four minutes just to talk about uh, what what that what that looks like for us personally. All righty. 
Welcome home, everyone. Welcome back. So uh, uh, I think I can see all of you on the screen. Uh, if you have a if you have a comment that that was you thought was uh, uh, important to share with the group from your your small groups, any wisdom that came out about yeah, Gail, unmute, unmute, Gail, unmute. I thought I was. Mine is just a comment about my own self. It's dealing with people who do not believe in the vaccinations. And if it's in your family, it can become an even bigger problem. Mm. So not, not just the challenge of being together as a congregation, just even being the challenge of being together as a family. Right. Uh, uh, Alex Miller. I'm sorry. No, Gail, go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm good. I'm good. It had nothing to do with that. Go ahead. Okay, go back. Alice. It's kind of hard to unite even the congregation when there are so many people that have differing opinions. And with the hatred that is filled in this world, we're never gonna come to a consensus unless people stop listening to garbage and start listening to the truth. So uh, this particular time of the year asks us to listen to the truth within our own soul and to eliminate some of that hatred and, and garbage that's in our, our own soul as, as part of the precursor that allows us to, to come together. Other, other comments about uh, gathering in this, in this particular age? Yeah, Roger. Well, I kind of think is we're judging ourselves as a community. Are we helping people in our community? Are we leaving the corners of the field with uh, something for the poor to eat? Uh, are, are we living very high? Uh, are we eating? Uh, are we celebrating too much and not taking care of the poor in our community? I think the community is being judged how we take care of the community. Like, you know, feder yeah, like Federation is taking care of a lot of people. How are we doing? It's a time to judge us as a whole. Beautiful. Alana, unmute. Hi. Yes. Um, I think that th despite the fact that there are a lot of divides, of course, I think that the global human experience that has been shared, um, a, a rarity in any of our lifetimes, basically in some junctures flattens uh, the equation out and essentially instead of making choices that we may make consciously or subconsciously by socioeconomic, cultural, ethnic, race or other divides, we are having to take actions that would protect the general populations. And again, I understand there are differing opinions, but I think it's a very kind of fascinating moment like sociologically it is a rare rare time to really ha have that happen where the choice you make every day if you you know if you can go beyond self of selfless selfishness is is really not about um, a race or an economic status or a group that you're in it's um kind of taking the action for the better of all. And, um, you know, I think that even obviously those stand perhaps on a very different, you know, place who, who may not believe something or, or other, but I think nonetheless, there is still like an understanding that the norms that we used to take kind of, we have a greater a power that's taken like gone beyond us and pushed us to have to think in a different way than we than we normally do. So uh, I read an article uh, about it and they said that uh, right now it requires of us radical empathy to somehow, uh, you know, there's this teaching uh, about the, the two people sitting at services and, and, uh, uh, and, uh, the, the notion that we really can't care about the person that's next to us unless we know how they're doing. Uh, and so part of our challenge is to, 
not just to empathize uh, by how we think people are doing, but perhaps this is a time of year when, especially now where we need to reach out to the fringes of our own personal community. You know, there's people that we, we talk to on a regular basis. I have my list, you have your list. Uh, and I'm not talking about, about the organizations that we belong to, I'm talking about in our own personal circle. Uh, and maybe we need to reach beyond the, the, the two or three or the five people that we're normally in contact with and reach out to that, that other group. Uh, Allison. Just to kind of pick up on what Alana said, um, we've all proven in the last year and a half that it's within us to completely change how we live and how we engage with others um, for the better good. And I just wonder what other ways we could be doing that. You know, um, really open to ideas here, but what more could I be doing? You know, what about my daily life? could be optimized just to help. Right, well, and this text is saying that, that one of the things that we can do is get to that urgent, desperate place in, exam, in, in the examination of our existence. Uh, and that by getting to that, and going to that place, uh, it will help us to move forward. I think Mark Revo, where's Mark? I saw his hand up, maybe he disappeared, okay. So uh, in, the, in the chapter, uh, Rabbi Lu uh, <clears throat> then gives uh, three different uh, powerful examples of being together in community and some of the ways in which it can affect us. He gives this example of his mother uh, playing the piano at Carnegie Hall, uh, you know, very powerful story and uses in, in a couple of these stories, a, a word that I've looked up, I almost called Joni to reference the word. Uh, he uses the word, and she appled, A-P-P-L-E-D. I've never heard apple as a verb. Uh, he, he uses it, uses it as being, uh, I kind of think maybe he's, what he's referring to is after a tree has been stripped of all of its apples, the tree has been appled. If we can get to that place of, when we get to that moment of desperation, of, uh, of being spiritually naked, if you will, uh, in this confession, uh, then perhaps we're, we're being appled. I don't know. But he gives these examples uh, uh, when he was in services in San Francisco, being overwhelmed by the large crowd. And then he gives a, a third story that I want us to look at, because I think in many ways, it's the, it's the crux of uh, Slichot and, and the point that he was making here. We're going to look at this story from the Baal Shem Tov, and then we're going to go into a breakout group. And I want to ask, I want to give you the question now before we hear the story, so you can kind of be uh, thinking about about it. Uh, there's a reference to an axe. What did the axe mean? What did the axe mean? And what does it mean to offer God and each other our broken hearts? What does it mean to offer to God and each other our broken hearts? So, uh, uh, Alice, you have a question or you're volunteering to read? I'm volunteering to read. You're on, Alice. You get to read. And, and I'm going to put it up here on the screen now. Every day before the days of awe. Wait, 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 wait. Is that what we're reading? Every year, right. Hold on one second here. Page 98. Yes. Okay. Every year before the days of awe, the Baal Shem Tov, the founder of Hasidic Judaism, held a competition to see who would blow the shofar for him on Rosh Hashanah. Now, if you wanted to blow the shofar for the Baal Shem Tov, not only did you have to blow the shofar like a virtuoso, but you also had to learn an elaborate system of kavanot, secret prayers that were said just before you blew the shofar to direct the shofar blasts and to see that they had the proper effect in the super, supernal realms. 
All the prospective chauffeur blowers practiced these cavanaud for months. They were difficult and complex. There was one fellow who wanted to blow the shofar for the Baal Shem Tov so badly that he had been practicing these cavanaud for years. But when his time came to audition before the Baal Shem, he realized that nothing he had done had prepared him adequately for the experience of standing before this great and holy man. And he applied. No, he no, 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 no. He appled. He and appled. he appled. I'm sorry. He choked. He choked. His mind froze completely. He couldn't remember one of the Kavanaud he had practiced for all those years. He couldn't even remember what he was supposed to be doing at all. He just stood before the Baal Shem in utter silence. And then when he realized how egregiously, how egregiously, how utterly he had failed this great test, his heart just broke in two when he began to weep sobbing loudly, his shoulders heaving, and his whole body racking as he wept. And hold on one second, Ellis. And now we're gonna get a typical, uh, uh, a typical rabbinic, Hasidic rabbinic response. And that is, instead of talking to the person about the experience they were having, a la uh, therapy, if you will, and to work out the problems, Instead, in the Hasidic tradition, the rabbi tells a story. Okay, so now we're, we're gonna, his whole body racking as he wept. All right, go ahead, Alice. All right, you're hired, the Baal Shem said. But I don't understand, the man said. I failed the test completely. I couldn't even remember one kavanah. So the Baal Shem explained with the following parable. In the palace of the king, there are many secret chambers and there are secret keys for each chamber, but one key unlocks them all and that key is the ax. The king is the Lord of the universe, the Baal Shem explained. The palace is the house of God. The secret chambers are the Sifarot, the ascending spiritual realms that bring us closer and closer to God when we perform commandments such as blowing the shofar with the proper intention and the secret keys are the kavanot and the ax, the key that opens every chamber and brings us directly into the presence of the king, wherever he may be, the ax is the broken heart. For as it says in the Psalms, God is close to the broken hearted. So before we go into the breakout groups, what does it mean to offer God and each other our broken hearts in the, you know, in the context of these, uh, these holy days? Okay, stop in the share. I think we're going to stop the recording for a moment. Uh, a couple of comments that came out of, out of the group, out of your breakout. Well, one of the comments um, of our group was that, you know, this is a time when we can acknowledge the worst of what we have either done or thought or were without, you know, feeling uh, judgment, but feeling like we really want to do a change. Like, you know, we, we were in cognizant of how bad things were, how we were, you know, not there. And now, uh, you know, we come to terms with that. We come to terms with the fact that we disappointed ourselves or others in, in a real way. Okay. Now, Roger? Just, we didn't really discuss this, but I keep thinking of the temptation song, What Becomes of the Brokenhearted. And, uh, uh, right? What becomes of the brokenhearted who have loved and now departed? So uh, that's all. I mean, I think it's a uh, apropos. Yep. Okay, so Lou then presents us with this uh, classic image of the uh, the book, the book of life being presented before us. Uh, and uh, 
I'm just gonna read this a little bit here. Let me share the screen. Talks about entering the, the sanctuary. But this time, as you enter the sanctuary, everything feels different. So you look more closely. There are three Ahmed's books at the head of the sanctuary. A presence can be felt in the room so palpably you can almost see it. It hovers over the table like a, a colloid suspension, a smoky mist. Now you hear a deep disembodied voice calling out names. And every time a name is called, it is written in one of the books. There is no hand, there's no quill. The pages of the book simply rustle and then quiver. When the rustling stops, the name is already written. It is written in the book of life. While sighs of relief go up all around the room, or it is written in the book of death. While a cold silence grips the sanctuary, amid much shuddering of shoulders and the sudden sucking in of breath, or it is written in the book of the intermediaries, those who will spend the next 10 days in a state of suspended judgment in the process of transformation, after which they will be entered into one of the other two books. All of a sudden, you hear your own name being called and you want to cry out, no, 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 not now. I didn't realize this was real. I thought this was just some empty ritual. I'm completely unprepared. I thought it was just what came after dinner with my family. Please give me some more time. Let me do something to affect the outcome of all this. But the voice continues to intone your name and there is a rustling of the pages of the book and your heart is gripped with terror as you wait to see in which one your name will be inscribed. That is, that's this period of year that we're, we're in. This very intense, experience of thinking about the book of our existence and what, what's going to be in that book, what's going to be written in that book. He goes on to say the following, I'm not going to put on the screen. <clears throat> he says, there is, this is no mere metaphor. This is no mere metaphor. No mere religious poetry. This is real. This is extremely powerful. And whatever preparation you might have made now seems utterly foolish, utterly inadequate. As the great voice intones your name and you hear it reverberating in the great room and the pages of one of the great books begin to rustle and you don't know which book it is in. That is the drama that we are playing out. And we can see it as poetry, we can see it as metaphor, we can see it as drama, or what Lou is, uh, Rabbi uh, Lou is, is challenging us to do is to see it as being real. That this is not a metaphor, it's not poetry. This, these, this is our life. This is our life. You know, uh, Harold Kushner, in, in uh, one of his books, he writes, no one on his deathbed ever said, gee, I wish I spent more time at work, you know? And uh, there's a lot of those corollaries. Gee, you know, on our deathbed, gee, I wish I had spent more time doing X. I wish I had spent less time doing Y. And this metaphor, or as Al Alan Lou says, it's not a metaphor, it's real. Is, uh, is, a uh, the, is a questions that we need to be asking ourselves all the time, not just when we're dying, but now when we can make changes. Now when we can make changes, when we can do something about the quality of our life, we can do something about, about our existence. Ag having that acknowledgement of the seriousness of, of our endeavors, is, you know, it's powerful. I, when I get into my car, I always, I always uh, hold my keys for just a moment and remind myself that this car 
is either transportation or an instrument of death. And that reminder helps me to put the phone down, not look at the text messages, uh, uh, pay attention to traffic both ways, check my darn blind spot, you know, uh, all of those things that we need to do to navigate our way safely so that it's an instrument of transportation. I'm always amazed how easy it is to get an accident and how few accidents there are in comparison to the, you know, the, the thousands and thousands of people traveling in these little spaces. Well, we're traveling in these little spaces in life as well. And our lives can be uh, instruments of uh, conduits of transportation, of feelings and of love and of great stuff, but our lives can also be instruments of real pain and causing real difficulty for ourselves and for others. And we are, we are, we are at this moment, we're about to drive. What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do with our lives? And, uh, and Lou asserts that it's very important for us to go into this very dark place, this place of, of, uh, of, uh, of fear, if you will, that maybe my name is being written in a book that I don't want it to be written in. On the, on the, on the festivals, on, the, on, this, uh, on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur during this period of time, we talk about teshuva, about repentance. And it appears in uh, two main uh, forms. One is teshuva me ahava, the other is teshuva me yira. Teshuva out of fear or teshuva out of love. This text is telling us to go deep into the fear and to make changes because we're afraid we're going to die. But the rabbis assert that that particular method of change is not nearly as good as making changes out of love because we love life, we love people around us, we love the world, we love our God, we love existence, and to make changes out of a place of love. And so as you're going through this process of, of repentance, of this deep dive into your own soul, uh, uh, challenging the assumptions of your life, yeah, do it out of a place of fear, but transfer, translate that into a place of, what does that mean to live out of a place of love? Not calling the people we care about because if we don't call them, they'll be mad at us, but calling them because we care about them. Not apologizing because we don't want someone to think less of us, but apologizing because it's the right thing to do. Living our life in that way is uh, uh, sometimes can only happen when we go to that to that depth of that experience. So it is traditional during this period of time for us <laughs> to stand together, which we're doing in this way, for us to make confession, our own personal confession, and for us to participate in this communal notion of sharing responsibility with each other in confession. Uh, one of the teachings around the, around the sounding of the shofar is that the first blast, the tekiah, is the call for us to come together. The second call uh, of the, the, the three, the three, those three notes are uh, to, uh, 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 to get us to, to tenderize our soul. It's to like open up our soul. And then the series of nine notes is one of this teaching is that those are our tears. Those are when we get to that place of being appled, that place of being uh, utterly, utterly uh, 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 aware of the nature of our lives. And then the tekiah gedolah is said to be 
the bringing together of those three sounds for the purpose of healing, for the purpose of sending us out back out into the world to live the best lives that we can, having gone through this very, very difficult experience of looking deeply, deeply at our lives. So I urge you to join us on Slichot, to uh, pay particular attention to those things in your life that you need to change. And I'm gonna give you a little blast of the shofar. Uh, the, even though it said it's a mitzvah here to blow the shofar, I would challenge the Baal Shem Tov. Look who's challenging the Baal Shem Tov. The mitzvah is to hear the shofar. It's to hear it. And then to do something with that sound that we hear. So I wish all of you a good, sweet, uh, healthy year. And uh, I look forward to us being together in whichever way we can. Shana Tova, a good, sweet, and healthy year to all of you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you, Shana Tova. Thank you, Shana Tova to everyone. Shana to everybody. Shana Tova. Thank you. Shana Tova. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.